Well, good morning and welcome to Bible Baptist Church in Bridgeport, Texas. We would like to begin this morning on this special Resurrection Day with a word of prayer and then we will uh, start our services. Lord God, as we come to you this morning, we thank you for what this day means in our faith. For surely, Lord, uh, uh, we, have, uh, we know you as a resurrected God, as a living God that sits in heaven on the right hand of the Father this morning, being the first fruits of much which will come after Lord, we're rejoicing in what you have given us in eternal life. And we pray, God, this morning for the preaching of the word. Uh, and, Lord, as we consider our nation and the world around us, Lord, bless the gospel as it going out today, not just from this pulpit, but from every pulpit that declares Jesus Christ uh, uh, dead for our sins and yet alive for our eternal life. Bless the services this morning. Uh, in Jesus' name, uh, amen. Well, we want to do a couple of things very quickly. We first want to thank you for uh, uh, tuning in uh, to our services this morning. And we want to uh, tell you how excited we are about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we know as a church we have not been able to meet. But uh, this morning God is working through technology and we still are able to rejoice and celebrate uh, as a church body, the resurrection of Christ, and not we alone with the technology that we're using now, uh, but others can tune in and others can hear uh, the message that will go forth this morning, and we pray that God will anoint it. The Bible says His Word will not return unto Him void, but shall do that which uh, He pleases. Amen. And we're excited uh, about that. Uh, and so that uh, we're going to, before I go further, let me, the young man that's playing our piano for us uh, every week is a learning to play the piano. And every week he labors very hard uh, to try to put together a brand new song for us each week so that we can have our, an introduction here with music. And I thank him so much. Uh, he's laid aside his own inhibitions and you know how shy you can be when, uh, when, uh, when you're not as talented as you think you should be. Uh, and yet my Bible tells me that God takes the weak things to confound the strong and the foolish things to confound the wise. And he's willing uh, to set up here and do this for the glory of God's sake that we have a little bit of music coming into this thing and we're we thank him for that and we're excited uh, that he has done so for us. Amen. This morning we're also blessed as we have again some special music for you. Brother Gary Pollock, one of the gentlemen in our church, is going to come and, and sing a special before the message this morning. Uh, and as he's coming, I would invite you to already begin to turn to your Bible in John uh, uh, chapter uh, 21. John chapter 21 is where we're going to be uh, this morning. And we're going to use several portions of Scripture, so be ready to do a little transitioning with us as we speak about uh, the power of the resurrection in the very person of Jesus Christ as he demonstrates uh, this power as he meets with his disciples on three different occasions. So be aware that we'll be moving a little bit and be prepared to do so. Brother Gary Pollock's going to come and sing for us. <coughs> Well, good morning, church. Mary came unto the tomb of Jesus. The stone I know whom seek ye. He is risen, this she heard him say. Gone, the stone is rolled back. Gone, the tomb is empty. Gone, to sit at his father's side. Over death triumphant gone Sin is defeated gone He lives forevermore My friend, if you don't know My risen Savior Oh, I beg of you Don't wait too late to pray 
till his bride has been completed. Don't wait till you hear him say it's too late. Gone, stone is rolled back, gone. The tomb is empty, gone. To sit at his father's side. Death triumphant gone, sin is defeated gone. He lives forevermore. Oh yes, he's gone. The stone is rolled back gone. The tomb is empty gone. To sit at his father's side. great song that is speaking about he is resurrected from the grave. He is gone. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Well, we're going to invite you this morning to the book of John uh, uh, chapter 21 and we're going to just use for our text verses 14, but we're going to use the verses previous to verse 14 in a few moments. Uh, so you might want to put your finger there in John 21 uh, and wait because we're going to use that later. We're also going to be in John chapter 21 uh, uh, and verses uh, uh, 14. Uh, I'm sorry, John chapter 20 and verses 19. We'll also be in John chapter 20 and verses 24 for those of you that want to uh, take time to do so. If you'll stand uh, uh, for just a moment, we're going to read a couple of verses and we'll start in verses 12. Uh, here is the story of Peter who has said, I go a fishing. We're going to deal with that in one of our points. But just want to start in verses 12 as Jesus now extends this invitation, this, uh, this uh, uh, power, I guess, of the resurrection. And he says in verses 12, uh, he saith to them, Come and dine. Uh, and none of his disciples does ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then uh, cometh and taketh bread and giveth them and fishes likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showeth himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. Thank you. I want to use verse 14 as our text. You may be seated, those few that are here. And uh, Jesus said, this is now the third time that he has met uh, uh, with his disciples. You recall the story of Jesus being crucified. I know on this uh, Resurrection Sunday that's being preached all across this nation. Uh, uh, and as the ladies came to the tomb and found the stone rolled back, uh, there was a, an angel sitting on the stone and he said, some, and he said uh, Why seek ye amongst the dead? For he is risen. Well, after Jesus rose from the grave, he begins to demonstrate uh, his power of resurrection. Remember, he's speaking to the church when he said, upon this rock I will build my uh, church. And now he's going to begin to meet with his disciples, that infancy of the church, that, uh, that beginning of what we are today uh, as he goes to the disciples uh, on three different uh, occasions. And I want to speak to you a little bit, if I might, about those occasions that Jesus manifested himself amongst men. The world considers you and I as believers uh, in Christ, we call ourselves Christians, they consider us to be somewhat uh, uh, foolish as we gather in the name of Jesus and we assemble as a church, though we're assembling today by technology, we are still assembling. And we sing, as you can tell. Uh, I was now, I don't know if you could hear me clapping or not, but I got a little excited. I like that song Gary was singing. Uh, we sing, we shout, we preach, we praise, we pray, and we do all of this uh, as a peculiar people. 
we do it uh, uh, to honor and glorify our God and to establish that we're on his side because we are serving a living king, a living Lord, amen? We call on his name and desire uh, to see his power come down from heaven and to meet with us. If we as a church meet and the power of God does not meet with us, we certainly have wasted our time and it's just, uh, it's just a matter of some folks getting together. And we claim that promise uh, in Matthew 18, 20, even this morning where it says, we're two or more together together in my name, there am I in their midst. And we believe that God will meet with us today and that this time will not just be a uh, an idle time of practicing some religious uh, 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 activities, but it will be a time where God uh, uh, will meet with us and will show his presence as he's going to in these areas that we're going to talk about in just a moment. We understand uh, that as we are meeting on this resurrected day, that our Lord, if he comes and meet with us, and we pray that he will, is not going to meet with us in a passive way. He isn't coming just to make us comfortable on the pew. He's not coming just to uh, uh, be here. He's coming to meet with us and to work a work amongst us. He's coming to do something miraculous, surely that will measure and indicate the resurrection uh, this morning, amen? And through the power of the Holy Spirit and as we preach the word of God, we're looking for uh, 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 God to, uh, to meet with us uh, as he met with his disciples on those three different occasions. So that we're going to take these times, if we might, and talk a little bit about the Lord Jesus meeting uh, uh, with the uh, believers meeting with the church, meeting with humanity, because I believe the resurrection today, uh, going through technology, is demonstrating the uh, the power of God. For the remember, as we said in our opening, uh, th that God said His word would not return into Him void, would do but would do that which He accomplished. And even though the body cannot meet, I believe it's the will of God and, and the word of God bears this up that we go and preach the gospel to every creature. What an opportunity we have today to preach the uh, gospel uh, to every creature. Amen. Thus as time will allow, we're going to look at these three times that Jesus met with his people and established his work, the power of his resurrection, the authority according to what uh, Acts 1.8 says that after that the Holy Spirit has come upon us we shall have power and he's going to demonstrate that power of the gospel in these three times that he's going to meet uh, uh, with his disciples. We'll begin in John chapter 20 if you will turn there in John chapter 20 uh, verses uh, uh, 19 and the Bible says this, then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, when the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. Uh, 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 and, and when he had uh, so said, he showed them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you." This is the church, you see, that's a symbol in the upper room. This is the disciples on which uh, uh, Jesus has called and said, I will make you fishers of men. This is they uh, uh, who would, uh, has walked with Christ for, uh, for three years, and yet it is now that they're in that upper room and they are uh, somewhat afraid, and the, uh, and the church is, uh, is not filled with the power of God, but filled with the fear of mankind. And uh, so I would just put this, por this portion or this appearance of Jesus that he comes to the church that he might strengthen them in their faith and set before them the authority of the resurrection and the commission of God to the church body. Amen. He brought, if you notice, the Bible says uh, on verses, verses 8, 19, in the same day at evening and being the first day of the week when the doors were shut with the disciples were assembled for the fear of the Jews, that Jesus stood in their midst and said unto them, listen to this, peace be unto you. In a day of confusion, for they have seen this one called Christ be crucified, they've seen him be buried, and that confusion of their faith and that confusion of their very purpose in the world uh, has brought them to a place to be in an upper room and be filled with fear. And yet I find here that the first thing that Jesus says is, peace be unto you. Turn loose of the turmoil of the world. Turn loose of the fear uh, and the confusion that has brought you to hide yourself in this upper room and be brave or be a, a bold in the things of God. In this unsettled time, I come to give you peace in this world. Remember, we're not of the world. 
uh, uh, but we're in the world. And the world's torment and, and confusion often does affect us. And God says, I will give you peace in this world. We don't know all the difficulties today that are in the church body and in those believers around the world, in the world itself. There are many today who are still in this urgency and in, the, in this time of this uh, virus, still having, uh, and sure, probably more of them, having financial difficulties, and many who are having health issues because of this virus, and maybe other things as well. We've heard about many who have lost their jobs, and uh, uh, finances are, are very difficult right now. Uh, and I know that uh, this is not over even when we're released from this shelter-in-place uh, edict. I think that we may wind up in a recession. I don't know. I'm not an economist, so don't take that to the bank. We'll let those people that do that tell us what's going on. But there will be repercussions. There will be fallout from this. And let me tell you, believers, because our, our Savior is alive, because our Savior sits on the right hand of the Father, my God says, peace be unto you. Uh, uh, remember uh, in John chapter 14, he says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. Be at peace with those things uh, that are around you. Amen. And he brought peace uh, uh, to the church that was assembled. Now notice in verses 20, as he comes to encourage the church, and brethren, surely we need to be encouraged today. We need to find the peace of God in this difficult hour. Uh, uh, but he goes further. Look in verses 20. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. I've got ahead of myself back up to verses 20. Uh, 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 the Bible says, uh, uh, And when he had so said, he showed him his hands and his feet. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. The word glad we might uh, change to use the word he was, they were filled with excitement. They were joyous. They were more than just, they didn't just say, oh, that's good. Uh, they got excited about like when I was listening to Gary sing that song about the resurrection. I couldn't keep my, uh, my hands from clapping and my feet from wanting to uh, uh, rejoice in the Lord for the excitement of that song. Well, they're here firsthand hearing Jesus say unto them, see me, behold me, it is I, I am alive, I am flesh and bone, uh, uh, I, am, uh, I am he that was crucified and today now I am alive and you see me, hallelujah, I think they got a little excited. They thought they had buried him and it was over. They were hiding for the fear of the people and now Jesus stands in their midst. Folks, I'm telling you, they got excited and I'm we ought to be getting a little bit of that excitement today as we who are saved by grace uh, uh, also know that he is alive. He's not dead. Uh, uh, we are uh, filled with that same joy. There ought to be a little bit of excitement in you today. Oh, you're sheltering in place? Okay, but that doesn't mean our Savior's not alive and the day we can't re that we can rejoice and have joy in that, uh, in that truth, amen? Why did they have joy? Why did they all of a sudden get excited? Can I tell you because he was alive? This was not a spirit they saw. This was not some average, I forgot the word, I let it get away, some, some uh, imitation fable. This was Jesus in the flesh and the bone. He's gonna offer him his hands. He's gonna offer him uh, uh, his flesh and he's gonna say, touch me, I'm real. We don't believe, we're not superstitious. We're not uh, 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 living in some make-believe world. We believe God is alive and he is alive today. They got excited because there was a resurrection because secondly, he had come to the assembly of believers. Do you remember when you got saved and God came to you? Wasn't that exciting? I'm telling you because all of a sudden your doubts were taken away, your fear was taken away and you knew a living, breathing Savior. Not only was, did he save your soul but he's also a coming king, amen? They got excited because the very faith that they had put in Christ when he said unto them, come and I will make you fishers of men and the Bible says they rose up and followed him. Now their faith has substance, Amen. Hebrews says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. They see Christ the life and there's substance now uh, uh, to their faith. I'm trying to hurry. I have a long message and somebody told me already just because you've got uh, uh, 50 minutes before you've used up an hour for your services, you don't necessarily have to preach 50 minutes. But I may have to to get this done. Amen. And you'll just have to take it up with Jesus. Remember, he's the one that told me to do this and he's alive. So it's not me, it's him. You're on your own with that. Amen. So uh, 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 not only did he bring them peace and joy, he brought them ability beyond themselves. Now read verse 21 that I read a little bit out of order last, a few minutes ago. Then said Jesus uh, to them again, 
Peace be unto you, same peace we spoke of uh, in the top. You don't have to have uh, a concern or worry about whether Jesus is alive. He is alive according to verse 19. But now he says, peace be unto you for a different reason. Not just to encourage your faith, but now to, uh, uh, to uh, admonish you to go forth uh, with the gospel. Listen to what he says. Uh, uh, peace be unto you as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. We don't go in our own power. We go in the power of a living Savior. The Bible says in Matthew uh, uh, 28, 18, Jesus came unto them and said, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. We do not go in our own power, but we go in his power. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you, he says in this verse. God never asks us as believers to do anything that he doesn't equip us to do. He said, go and I will give you the ability. Go and I will give you uh, uh, the finances. Go and I will give you beyond what you think uh, uh, you can do. I will give you the ability to carry out the great commission. Amen. He brought uh, uh, a commissioning. Amen. And then I find uh, that he also not only equipped them and uh, gave them peace to, uh, to go forth to the world and to tell them to come out of that upper room of fear and to tell people Jesus is alive. Notice the third thing he does within the church body in verse 22. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Remember what I told you? God never sends us that he doesn't equip us. Acts chapter 1 and verses 8 says that you shall be witnesses unto me. After that the Holy Ghost has come, you shall receive power. Amen? So not only are they commissioned to go, uh, but now they're empowered with the power of God to carry the message. It's not them, it's God. When you go out and tell people about Jesus, you're not doing it according to your own ability. You're not doing it with your own power, although I've seen many, many, many men and women who have natural talent. Uh, I've seen people that can sell uh, 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 Ice cubes to Eskimos, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I've seen people that have a natural talent. Most of us do not, amen? amen. But no matter what your talent range, when you go with the gospel message, Jesus crucified, buried, and alive, God empowers that message, amen? Uh, uh, so we have power, and he met with the church that he might bring them encouragement and peace and commission and power. I think these disciples in this upper room after this meeting with Jesus weren't the same as they were when Jesus appeared into their midst. On this day, let it make this resurrection time make a difference in our lives. Let us have that same peace and that same joy and that same power uh, of the gospel, amen? And then if you will, uh, uh, turn over just a little further uh, to John chapter 20 and verses 24. <coughs> there seems to always be those who miss out. Amen? Now all the disciples are assembled in the upper room, save one, and in verses 24, he's introduced to us. It says, but Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, now notice uh, uh, it says, was not with them when Jesus came. Now it doesn't matter why, and we're not told why. All we're told was he was not there. But I believe in my own heart, based on the rest of the scripture, uh, uh, that it was because there was a problem in Thomas's heart. We'll talk about that. Listen and read on. It says, Then the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see his hands and, and the prints of his nails, or the print of the nails, and put my fingers in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side. Listen to this. I will not believe. And after eight days, again, his disciples uh, uh, were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, uh, the door being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Every time Jesus meets with uh, the church, there should be a peace that's brought to us. Amen. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach the hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and, and reach hither uh, uh, thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord, and my God. And Jesus said unto, them, unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Because that blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. 
Now, one day, maybe we'll begin, uh, have a chance to talk a little bit about the theology of these verses as to whether or not uh, uh, Thomas was just a discouraged believer or whether or not uh, Thomas had no uh, faith in, in, in Jesus' ab ability concerning himself as the Messiah. I don't know. We'll talk about it some other time. What I want you to see is that in this portion of Scripture, he represents the unbelieving. Thomas said, I will not believe. And surely that is the testimony of the world today. They say, I will not believe. The unbelieving uh, receive not the testimony of believers. Remember the 12 uh, uh, or 11 have come to uh, Thomas and said, we've seen Jesus. Can I tell you what I know about Jesus won't help you one bit until you know it yourself? Jesus has got to be your God. I can't be the uh, mediator of your faith with God. Uh, there's only one mediator in, a mediator in heaven and that's the God man Christ Jesus. Amen. And so Thomas is going to represent for us here that Jesus meets with the church body uh, uh, first to encourage the church and secondly to convince the unbeliever. Amen. That's why we meet even today. Amen. Uh, uh, that we might set Jesus crucified before the world. God uh, uh, needs to or needs us to be that testimony that the disciples were, no doubt. We need to be telling Jesus or people, we've seen him, he is alive. But I'm telling you, uh, uh, often uh, it will not hit a true note in their heart until they see Jesus themselves. Those who need uh, to see Jesus must be as we were, born of faith. They must be brought to Jesus uh, 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 to be uh, exposed to who he is. What we're doing this morning isn't just to encourage the body of Christ in the resurrection day, but it is to tell those who have not uh, faith in God that there is a resurrection and you can see Jesus yourself personally. Amen. Uh, those who, or oh, oh, let me read this in verse 26 with you. And, and, and after eight days again, his disciples were with him and Thomas with them. There is no substitute to those who believe in Jesus helping and encouraging those who say they will not believe to stand in the presence of the preaching of the word and to stand in the presence of where Jesus is going to meet with his body. Amen? It is important that we invite people to church, that we witness to people, that we might stand them in the place where Jesus stands. Amen? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> and notice what it says. G. Thomas said when they witnessed to him, I won't believe unless I see it. Amen? And, th and then I read this. And Thomas was with them. Something brought him. Maybe it was because he remembered uh, uh, everything that he had seen in Jesus. And one of the reasons that I will use this portion of Scripture as a a place where Jesus is trying to convince the unbeliever uh, is that the Bible says uh, that uh, the gospel, the death, the burial, and resurrection is, on, uh, is that foundational stone on which all our faith rests. Our, our, our belief in a Savior comes because he came forth from the grave paying the price for our sins and leaving our sins in that grave. He comes forth as a living Savior. Amen. He died on the cross with my sins upon him. Amen. And so I'm not sure that it's possible. And if I wanted to get really theological, I'd say I know it's not possible to believe in Jesus Christ as a Savior unless you see him resurrected from the grave. Unless you see him alive as one who's been victorious over death and the grave, one who's been victorious over sin, who can offer to you the holiness and righteousness of God. So Thomas says, I will not believe unless I see. So was he a believer before this time? I think he, like so many, uh, uh, may have thought much of Christ, may have seen great possibility in Christ, but Jesus died and left all of his expectations unfulfilled. And now he's being told, oh, but he's alive. And Thomas says, not to me, he's not. Not till I see it. And so we find that Jesus now is going to come into their midst, Thomas being there, he that said, I will not believe, being there with uh, uh, the disciples and seeing what's about to occur, seeing this testimony. Verse uh, 26, and look at verse uh, 27. Jesus in verse 26 appears and said, Peace be unto you. And then in verses 27, he says, and Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now notice Jesus said of Thomas, Be not faithless, 
but believing. Amen? The only, re, the only correction for unbelief is belief. Amen? And so Jesus is going to come, stand in their midst, and he's going to confront the unbelieving. Can I tell you every time that we meet as a church, God's going to encourage the believer, but he's going to confront the unbeliever. Every time we go out on the street and give witness of Christ, he's going to confront the unbeliever. Uh, uh, that is our purpose, is it not? That we are the light of the world. We're not the light, we're the testimony of the light. And here's the most interesting thing. In verses 27, Jesus says to Thomas, let me do a little paraphrase and read between the lines. I'm not changing the scripture, I just want you to understand it. Jesus says to Thomas, what will it take for you to believe in me? Thomas has already set the level of belief. He said, only if I see it, only if I see the nail prints, only if I see the, uh, uh, the scar in the side, only unless I can touch those things and know they're real will I believe. And in verses 27, Jesus responds to Thomas's re- request that he might have faith in a living Savior because look what he does. He says, touch me. Put your fingers in the nail prints. Put your uh, a hand in my side. And know, listen to what he says, and know that it is me. Amen? Uh, uh, amen. Uh, I, 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 and I think that the Lord has given to Thomas that which is required. Now listen, I want to take you on just a short little, I would say chase a rabbit, but it's not a rabbit. I've got it written right here in my text, so don't believe that. I want you to do this with me. If you're out there watching us and you've not receive Christ as your Savior. You have in your life, because you've been around Christian people, you have seen marvelous things that God has done according to their testimony. You've seen uh, the testimony of healing. You've seen uh, the testimony of supply. You've seen what the believers have shared with you uh, uh, about Jesus. And yet you've said in in your heart, I will not believe. Why not? Well, there are things in my life that I would desire to know for a fact. Can I tell you religion or believing in Jesus Christ being saved is a matter of fact. It's not superstition and it's not some uh, uh, off the wall involvement. Uh, 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 It is a matter of fact. And so today as Jesus meets with his body, uh, he comes to encourage the church but he comes to convict the unbeliever. And let me ask you to do this. If you've seen by testimony this person called Jesus but you've never received him, what will it take to believe? Now, I'm not talking about some off-the-wall junk. Don't well, I'll believe in Jesus uh, if God will give me a million dollars through the lottery. You're not trying to please God in that. You're trying to get rich. But what would it take for you to believe? Would it take God lifting out of your heart some grievous thing that's happened in your past where you've lost a loved one and you're blaming God for it? Would it take God uh, taking away uh, some guiltiness out of your heart uh, uh, for some thing that you've done? What would it take for you to believe God? God meets with us in the power of the resurrection that he might uh, 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 give to the lost man a testimony of who he is. Thomas said, I won't believe unless I can touch it. Amen? Amen. Jesus said to him, touch it. What would it take for you to believe? Because I listen, I see where God comes, having known what Thomas needed, and gives exactly what Thomas needed. And then I hear Thomas's testimony in verse 28. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Thomas now no longer is one who says, I will not believe, but now is one of the 12 who says, I know for a fact he's alive. I seen all those things that gave testimony, all those works that said he was the Messiah, but I've not seen him myself, and I will not believe until I see him, and God gave him the evidence that he needed to believe. God will give you that evidence. He gave it to me. I wished I had time to tell you my testimony. Uh, about how God saved me at 30 years old. And I'm telling you, if anybody ever needed to be saved, it was me. I'm like Paul. I could say I was the chiefest of all sinners. Amen? Uh, uh, So uh, there is a a living God, and he will meet you where you are. This is the most unusual thing. God doesn't say you got to clean yourself up. He doesn't say you got to talk a certain way, look a certain way, walk a certain way. He says come just as you are. Come and tell me how I can show you who I am. And you can meet me at the cross. You can meet me, a resurrected Savior who is alive, flesh flesh and bone. 
Now notice it doesn't say blood. He shed the blood on the cross and he took that blood and put it on the mercy seat. He's flesh and bone. Amen. And so he's going to give evidence to the lost. Now I'm going to ask you to go back over where we were in John chapter 21, where we started this morning. <clears throat> it, it, it confuses me a little bit how I can get from verse 29 in Matthew, oh, I'm sorry, in John chapter 20, where Thomas is with, <clears throat> with the 12, <clears throat> is one of the 12, uh, uh, and uh, they're all so excited about Jesus. They've had two great Lord's Days. I mean, it's been awesome. He's met with the church and encouraged him. He's, he's convinced the unbeliever. Uh, it's been an awesome two-day or two-weekend services. Two Sundays have passed, amen? And then I get all the way down into Matthew uh, uh, chapter 21, and somewhere between Matthew 20, or forgive me for saying Matthew, it's John, John uh, 21, by the, we get down to verses uh, uh, 3. Read in verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the, to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on, his, on this wise showed he him himself. Now we've come to this third time that Jesus is going to meet with his disciples, meet with the church. And I see the condition that the church is in. In verses 3 it says this, And Simon Peter said unto them, I go a fishing. How did we get from the excitement in chapter 20 to this going fishing in verse in chapter 21. Peter's not saying like some of us Christians like to go fishing. I like to fish. Don't get a chance to do it a lot, but I like to fish. Uh, amen. They weren't going on a, a Friday outing to go catch a few fish and enjoy some fellowship. What the Peter is saying is I've messed up this thing of Christian living. I've messed up this walking with God. I'm so disappointed in who I am. I'm just going to quit. I'm going to go back to the old way. I'm going to go back and do what I used to do, where I felt uh, successful and uh, uh, what I did was by my own hands and I didn't have to uh, uh, have the consent or the pleasure of God flowing through me. I could just do it and I'm going to get out of this thing uh, of Christian service. Amen? Read a little bit further if you think I'm uh, uh, kidding. Uh, and so Peter, he says, I go a fishing. Then then say unto him, we also go with thee. I don't have time to talk about this, but any time you turn and walk away from God, you will take people with you. Amen. And he says, and they went forth and entered into a ship, and immediately, uh, uh, and that night they caught nothing. Verse 4. But when the morning was now come, Jesus stood on the shore, uh, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said unto them, children, have you any meat? And they answered him, No. Believer, let me tell you something. When you're not walking with God, you'll have no success in your life. Oh, you'll reach almost that water level where you can feel your nose get just above the water and God will take it away because he's trying to get your attention. You remember another time when they were in the sea and they had cast their nets all night long and they had caught nothing and Jesus come and he said, cast your nets over here. You're about to see that happen again. In the power of that great miracle, God will be revealing himself to the backslidden. God will reveal himself to you this morning. Listen to this. Verse 6, same, almost the same story. And he said unto them, Cast the net on the right side of the ship, and ye shall find. And they cast therefore, and now they were not able to draw uh, it to the multitude uh, because of the multitude of fishes. Same miracle. That's how he ends. Listen to what happens next. Verse 7. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, it's the Lord. How do he know? Because of the fishes in the, in the net. Because they had seen him do this before. Amen. Therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved. I'm sorry, let's not read that again. Uh, uh, read down in verses 8. And the other disciples came uh, in, a, in a little ship, for they were not far from the land, uh, but, it was, uh, but as it were, two, uh, 200 cubits, dragging the net with the fishes with them. Now, for time's sake, and I'm already about to use up my time, <clears throat> let me hurry on if I can. The third time that Jesus meets with his disciples or with the body of Christ is to encourage and reclaim the backslidden. Amen? To encourage and to reclaim the backslidden. Peter said, I go a fishing. Back up to verse 2 of this chapter 21. And they were together, Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus. There's that Thomas who uh, just a few verses earlier, verse 27, puts his hand in the nail prints and cries out in verse 28, my Lord and my God. Now Peter says, I go a fishing. And Thomas said, me too. And Nathanael of Canaan and, uh, in Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples. 
Now, if you add that all up, there's seven disciples gone fishing. Judas, already at this point, has committed suicide, is not part of the 12. And so there's actually just 11 left, and here's seven of them. That means only four disciples are not gone fishing. Amen? So there's a little bit of a problem of the strength of faith in the body of Christ at this point. Peter was the, was the ringleader, but can I tell you these other six went with him? It had, to be, they, it had to be that they had the same disbelief in their heart, the same attitude to be backslidden from God because they didn't encourage Peter. The Bible says uh, uh, if you're a spiritual man and you see a brother taken in a fault, you're to go to him and restore him, to encourage him, to put him back in the, uh, in the boat, to put him back in a place of faith. But these disciples did none of that one with the other. They all just went fishing. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Peter uh, 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 is, uh, is the ringleader, yes, but he's not any more guilty than the other six. They've gone back to the life that they had before Jesus. They've gone back uh, to, to the ships and possibly to make a living doing uh, this thing called fishing. Peter has lost his fellowship. Maybe when Jesus looked at him after he denied him three times and the Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly because he was ashamed in his own heart. Maybe that was still the failure that Peter hadn't turned loose of uh, and, and that may have been what he built upon and it drug him away from the Lord and drug him into a, a valley of, of self-pity and uh, uh, he just couldn't get a hold on it and so he just left. You know when seven men go fishing, the testimony of the resurrection takes a hit. Amen? Now instead of being uh, uh, 11 testimonies, there's but four. And we're not sure even where they are. But that's not my message this morning. So he has gone fishing. Amen? Uh, uh, and no longer will there be a witness. Uh, uh, no longer uh, will there be that testimony of a resurrected Savior. And let me show you how bad it is when this occurs. Uh, in verses 4. It says, but when the morning was, uh, was now come, this is after they fished all night, Jesus, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. Can I tell you how you can know if you're backslid? When's the last time you heard Jesus' voice in your life and recognized it as Christ? Here's seven disciples who have been with him for three years, have seen him, have in, were in these first two meetings on the Lord's Day that we've already talked about themselves. But right now they're in such a spiritual condition they don't even recognize who Jesus is. Amen. So that we find here that Jesus comes and stands there on the Sure, and he does so that he might reclaim the backslidden. He offers what they did, just as he did with Thomas. He offers to Thomas that evidence of who he is. He's going to set before them a testimony that will convict them of their backslidden condition, that being the fishes in the net. Amen? Only Jesus could do that. They've seen it done before. You remember well, let me, let me set that aside just a moment when I say this. If you are yourself, and you know this, you're less of a Christian now than you've ever been before, ask God to reveal himself to you as he once did. And walk, uh, ask God to show himself to you in a way that you will know and recognize him. Amen? Amen? I recall, now we can go to what I was going to say, I recall a gentleman by the name of Gideon. Gideon was hiding himself in the threshing floor when the angel of God comes to him and uses a most unusual phrase. He says, O mighty man of valor, or of God. And Gideon says, Who, me? He was a fearful person, and yet God sees in him the potential, not the daily action. Okay? And Gideon says, If you be God, then I'm going to ask you to do something. And I'm going to use a fleece. And you know the story. He's going to do it twice. Once the ground will be dry and the fleece wet. Once the ground will be wet and the fleece dry. And by that testimony, Gideon is going to go forth and have one of the greatest victories that we read about in the Old Testament. Gideon and his 300 as they defeat the enemies of God. And it all occurred because Gideon just wanted a little evidence. That Savior, that Jesus that saved your soul, that wrote your name in the Lamb's book, that you have said to him at whatever place and for whatever reason, I go a-fishing. 
I've made a mess out of this serving God. I, I, I've not been uh, uh, fulfilled. I'm just going to get away from God. I go a fishing. And you're out there doing this thing, and yet you feel the tug of God. You feel the conviction of being where you're not supposed to be. Amen? And God's going to come, and he's going to do for these disciples something they will recognize and say, this is the Savior. Ask God to give you a remembrance of your life before you went fishing. And ask him to show you uh, 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 and to shake you in your unbelief, to shake you in your backslidden condition. Amen? When we come before God, God desires to encourage the church to convict the unbelieving, but he desires to restore the backslidden. Amen? He desires to bring us to a place uh, that we might be excited about who Jesus is in our life. Amen? When we think about this testimony here of Jesus and his disciples as he's on the side, his presence is going to put them back to work. Amen? If you look here, uh, uh, verse 7 of, my, of John chapter 21, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that, he was, uh, that it was the Lord, uh, he girded his, uh, his fisher's coat unto him, uh, unto him, for he was naked, and did cast himself into the sea. Uh, and the other disciples came uh, in a, a little ship, and when they were not far from land, but it was, uh, was, and it was, and it were 200 cubits, dragging the net with their fishes. As soon as they uh, were come uh, to the land, they saw the fire and the coals, and, laid, uh, and, and the fish lay upon thereon and bread. Excuse me for reading. I'm getting ahead of myself, and I'm going too fast again. Uh, that's the problem of not having an audience. Amen. Uh, uh, and Jesus said unto them in verses 10, bring, uh, bring them the fish which you have now caught. Amen. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land full of great fishes, 130 and three. And for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. The first thing I notice is that God recalls the backslidden and puts them right back to work. You know why a lot of Christians don't get right with God and they know they need to? Because in the Bible, in Revelation, it says, repent, return, and listen to this, and do thy first works. It's not that we wouldn't like to walk with God again. It's not that we wouldn't like to be in sweet fellowship. But we remember how hard it was when we served God to teach those Sunday school classes, to be faithful to church, to go out and knock doors, to give our tithe, to do all the things that we as believers do. And we say, I just don't want to go back to that. You forgot something. When you were serving God, you were serving God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And those things that seemed from a backslidden position to be a burden to you were no burden at all because God equipped you and empowered you to do them. Amen. Amen. And so I find that the Lord comes to, uh, uh, to reclaim the backslidden. Amen. And I have to tell you this, his presence is needed uh, uh, to restore they that are backslidden. Amen. Uh, his presence puts them back to work uh, and they begin to handle the net and they begin to get right with God and they begin to be, uh, uh, be equipped to go out now and be that testimony of who God is uh, uh, afresh. Amen? Now let me warn you a couple of things. When you're backslidden, you may have forgotten God. They didn't recognize his voice. God hadn't forgotten you. And here's the hardest thing. I'm going to tell you this. If you're, if you're a believer, you know you're going to heaven, but you're not serving God. God knows where you are. And he's going to come and find you where you don't want to be found out fishing, doing that which is right to your flesh and not that which is right to the spirit. He's going to find you looking like you don't want to be looking. The Bible tells me that when Peter knew it was Jesus, he's cast himself into the sea because all he had on was his fisher's garment and he was naked. Now that doesn't mean he was naked like you and I think about nakedness. He was down only to his work clothing. He was down to the garment the fisher would wear as he would tuck his garment in at the waist and go about serving the nets and fishing for fish. He wasn't naked to the bone like you and I would think about it. But he was not presentable in the presence of the Lord. Can I tell you if you're backslidden, you're not presentable in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's why God put 1 John 1, 9 in the Bible. If I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me my sins and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Amen. 
And so uh, uh, Peter needed uh, to be restored to fellowship. He didn't need to know God again as his Savior. He didn't need to go back uh, uh, to John chapter 20 and, uh, and see Jesus one more time alive. He didn't need to be in those exciting services. Uh, uh, they were a part of who he was. All he needed now was to be brought back to fellowship. And you'll find later that Jesus uh, will say uh, unto Peter, Lovest thou me? And Peter says, Lord, you know I love you. And Jesus said, Then feed my lambs. Amen. He does that three times with Peter. By the way, G Peter denies Jesus three times, and three times uh, uh, the Lord calls him back to serve him in the ministry of taking care of this flock of God. Amen. And in verses 13, and we're almost done, the Lord's going to restore sweet fellowship. And he says this, come and die. Amen. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them uh, uh, and the fishes likewise. Uh, uh, and he's going to say to them uh, uh, that this thing now uh, that has once been in your life where you've said I've gone a fishing now has been put back, put away. Now they're in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now they have, uh, uh, are, are standing in the very presence of the Lord uh, uh, and are uh, uh, sweetly in fellowship once more. Without fellowship, this life for a believer is hard. In fact, you are worse off if you're a saved person without fellowship in God than you were when you were lost, other than the fact you're going, you were going to hell then. But you're, 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 not, you, you're not in either camp. I'm going to preach tonight on the three different divisions of, the house, or of, of humanity. But you're not in the house of the lost because your name's written in the Lamb's book. You're not in the house of the, of the, uh, of the faithful because you're backslidden toward God. You're just out there in no man's land, uh, uh, and it's really a hard place. You're all by yourself. Amen? And so the Lord says to them, uh, uh, there's fishes laid, uh, and in verses 12, Jesus said to them, come and dine, and none of the disciples does ask him, who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Isn't it good? You see, you don't have to go back to the cross and be forgiven again. You just got to be brought back into fellowship by the washing and forgiveness of your backslidden condition. And then it will be that you will know that it is him. Amen? Today's Easter, and we celebrate the resurrection. But that resurrection is a power. It's not just an occurrence. It's a power that's loosed within the church. And every time we meet, we ask God in the power of the resurrection to meet with us. Not as, uh, as something that's just there, but something that will work amongst us. And we ask the, that God uh, uh, first will meet with us and encourage the church. Surely we need to be encouraged. Surely we need our faith strengthened as we live in this uh, shelter and place thing and we can't even meet as a church in this time of resurrection. Surely we need today to be encouraged. May God encourage you. The second thing I find is that God comes uh, uh, to develop faith in the unbelieving. Ask God to, to give you that which will make you to be a believer. Ask God to show you the nail prints. Ask him to show you the, uh, the, the spear price in his side that you might touch it. Prove to yourself today. Amen? I can't prove God to you. God will prove God to you. Amen? That's not my job to prove God to you. It's my job to tell you Jesus loves you and save sinners. It's God's job to convert you. I don't convert. I don't save anybody. I had someone uh, uh, say to me once, Preacher, thank you for saving me. I told him real quick, I didn't save him. Amen. All I did was tell him about a Jesus Christ that died for his sins that would save him. Amen? And so God's here this morning doing a work with those who are unbelievers that you might believe and know that he is your Savior and that you might cry out, my Lord and my God. The third thing I think that he met with the, the disciples were, or met with the church was, uh, for was to restore fellowship to those who had gone fishing. Amen? That they might repent of their sins and have fellowship again that they might know the presence of God and that they might begin to draw the nets again themselves, being fishers of men, not fishers of fish. That they might know the Lord uh, had received them back and that there was a sweetness in their fellowship and all things had been put away and now was there a great fellowship with them. Our prayer this morning on this Easter Sunday is God, meet with us. There will be no excitement on Easter unless Jesus meets with us. There will be no purpose in this telecast unless Jesus meets with us. Amen. Amen. Our prayer today is that if you are here and you are in turmoil as a believer, may God give you joy and peace. 
If you're here and an unbeliever and you're listening to us, take time. The Bible says, if you believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Make a decision for God Almighty. And if you're listening to us and you're backslidden, and there's been a while since you've been in God's house, or been a while since you've been faithful to the Lord. Listen to me. God knows where you are. He knows how you dressed. He knows how you act. And he's going to come looking for you this morning. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to preach this morning. We pray that this message will go out and touch hearts. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us the opportunity through technology to still be able to minister to our church body. We ask, Lord, that you will uh, just forgive us and where we fail you, Lord, each and every day. God, we're, we're no better than when Peter went fishing. Every day we have to renew our minds daily. Every day we have to deal with ourself. My prayer, Lord, as I've told my church so often, my prayer today, Lord, is that you help me to act like Jesus, not like me. So bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.